Now we are going to talk about uh, music perception and how music is perceived inside the brain. Oh, that's a really beautiful part of the process and one of the pieces that people have done lots of different studies and there are many things that we know about that but there, there are lots of complexities in terms of how this is going to be processed. We know that there are areas in the auditory cortex that are involved in music performance. We have areas in the motor system that are involved and how they are working together to be able to beautifully play violin in a way that impress others and just kind of induce lots of emotions among others. And in reality, that is a really interesting part of the, the auditory process that is going to uh, make lots of kind of uh, clinical impressions as well. So there are different studies in terms of how this, this system is working. So let me just start with some of the pieces of information. So we have been discussing, about, okay, okay, these are the areas that are involved, how they are involved in, in music production. For example, this part, the permotor cortex, when we train people for being able to play a melody, when they learn a, a specific melody to, to play, when we expose them to that melody, we have higher activation in premotor cortex. So premotor cortex is about, let's say, motor plans motor plans, okay? Then if we give people just, this is another study, if we give people just music to listen, if they are just listening to music, they have, we have a significant activation in the auditory cortex. If we ask them to just play the music without being able to listen to the music, okay? So they play it without being able to have a, any auditory feedback to listen to that. So there is no sound. We have activation because motor cortex is just bringing out the maps and just kind of following the map to be able to, to make these motor movements. And in, in reality, in music production, we have all these things working together. There is another area that we call supplementary motor area. This area gets activated when we show people, just we just give them a music to, to listen. If you are a, a person who is able to play music, you have activations in supplementary motor areas. And this part is about motor imagination. Which is a little bit different compared to motor plans. This is an interesting area that when I show people drug-related pictures, do you expect them to have any motor imagination? If I go back to kind of the experiments that we have been discussing about before, are we going to have any activation in that part of the cortex? The basically superior frontal, this part of superior frontal gyrus. As you can see here, we do not have very much activation here. But these people are met users who are in a residential center. When I bring people from outpatient clinics and they have a sort of unconscious hope that when they go out of the scanning session, they might be able to get drugs, they start to have motor imagination. So then they have activations here. So activation in these areas would be related to whether they can have access to drugs or not. But as they do not have access to drugs, they do not have any motor plan. So they cannot have access. So they know that it's nothing motor is going to happen. As they are not having any planning to be able to do, this is not, not happening. So that is amazing that these areas are not only for uh, what we are discussing about music perception or, or kind of music production, there are implications in other areas as well. Okay, so these, these are the areas that are involved in music production. 
And then there are different pathways here involved. There are some pathways that are linking to the auditory system, to the limbic system. So they bring information from cochlear nucleus to the auditory cortex and from auditory cortex and thalamus to amygdala. So there are pathways to amygdala that the, the auditory system is processing and that is going to make emotions when we have music. So there is a specific pathway to make emotions. And there are some other pathways that are going to areas like nucleus accumbens and also motor cortex, the red one. Visceral motor, okay? Nucleus accumbens, motor cortex. And these are the pieces that makes us happy and excited and feel dancing with the music. So these are the pathways that are activating those, those aspects. And there are also kind of some uh, motor areas that are involved that we, that we start to just kind of go with that rhythm and just try to kind of uh, sync us to the, to the rhythm that we listen inside the music. Okay, there are studies for that. People try to see, to kind of map these areas. What are the areas that could be activated with music? Activations in the reward areas, in memories, as we discussed, emotions, kind of uh, reward processing, decision making. Those areas are involved when we expose people to music. And it's always a discussion in terms of how music is, is, is processed in the brain. Is music using exactly the same area that a speech is using for processing, or music has its own kind of areas for, for being processed? We know that there are significant overlaps between the areas that are processing speech and music, but there are some specific distinctions in terms of the pathways that music has access to, but speech does not have that level of access. And as you can see here, when we talk about the speech, there are mainly areas related to intentionality. But when we talk about music, we have kind of the affect size more actively involved. And all of them are processed in the conscious, conscious way. The last piece about uh, uh, kind of music perception is an idea about frequencies and rhythms. <clears throat> We know that in music, we have frequencies, right? We know that in the brain, we also have frequencies. And frequencies in the brain are important for connecting areas together. So we know that areas that they have the same rhythms, they connect to each other. So synchronization in brain areas means that they are getting connected to each other. Interestingly, some of the frequencies that we have in music are close to the frequencies that are, are related to some of these brain connectivities. And then the question is that, is there any way that music is using the frequencies to connect different areas in the brain or not? And then it basically goes beyond just what we have in terms of the speech processing, then these frequencies are kind of stimulating pathways that are not being stimulated by speech. And they are kind of going to the kind of the, another level of, of being able to change processes that are happening inside the brain. These ideas are still controversial and under discussion and how these things are related to each other. There are still people discussing about how music is being perceived. But it is another important piece of uh, auditory processing, how music is being perceived, and why we have such an interesting universal language for kind of music. And those who are kind of expert in music, they can e easily even see within an orchestrate how different instruments are talking to each other. And even they can easily say that, I mean, there are kind of discussions that are happening, but they cannot describe those discussions. And even some of those emotions to the kind of 
normal language that we have. So they can say that there are things that are happening that I cannot explain by, by my language. And this is the interesting, exciting part about the music. I think that people have never kind of touched the bottom of that really complex process in the brain. Okay, so this is the last part of the section related to music processing.